Hello everybody, my name's Kevin Logan and I'm one of the founding members of the collaborative art group Thick Hair. Um, regarding one of our more recent forays into the collation of information, I'd like to begin by looking at a typical dictionary definition of the term data. The term data, the term data most commonly alludes to facts and statistics collected together for reference or analysis. In computing, it refers to the quantities, characters and symbols on which operations are performed by a computer. Being stored and transmitted in the form of electrical signals and recorded on magnetic, optical or mechanical recording media. In the fields of the humanities and philosophy, broadly speaking, data refers to things known or assumed as facts, making the basis of reasoning or calculation. To elaborate on the idea of data as fact, I'd like to read a short quote from the lyrics of a song. This song appears in the album Space Songs. Sorry, Space Songs. It was released in 1959 as part of a series of educational music records for children. The series is entitled Ballads for the Age of Science. <clears throat> Quote, it's a scientific fact, a scientific fact. It has to be correct, it has to be exact. Because it is, because it is a scientific fact. It's been proven to be true, like one and one are two. It's checked and double checked a fact that can be backed because it is, because it is a scientific fact. It's a scientific fact, a scientific fact. It has to be correct, it has to be exact. Because it is, because it is a scientific fact." Unquote. From the perspective of statistical practice, data collection raises three quite different sorts of ethical issues. These are the suitability and validity of the methods employed in any given data collection, the degree to which confidentiality and privacy obligations are respected, and C, the overall aims of a given data collection. Paramount to the validity of data mining is the results and observations must be reproducible. In scientific methodology, this is referred to as test, retest, reliability, or simply repeatability. Well, of course, even well, of course, scientific, even scientific facts, are not, facts exact, are not perfectly exact, but they are as exact as, 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 as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. At the time. Well, of well, of course, course even scientific, scientific facts are, are not perfectly exact, exact but, but they, they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, well, of even course, scientific even facts scientific are not are perfectly not exact, exact, but they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, even scientific, even scientific facts, facts are not perfectly are exact, not perfectly but exact, they are as exact are as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, well, of course even, even scientific, scientific facts, facts are not perfectly, are not exact, perfectly exact, but they are but as they exact are as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, well, of course even scientific facts, facts are not perfectly are not exact, perfectly but they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not humanly possible, but they are as perfectly exact as it is to make them at the time. Well, of course, well, of even course, scientific even facts are not perfectly exact, not but they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of course, well, of even course, scientific even facts are not are perfectly correct, but they are as impossible as it is to make them possibly at the time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are exactly human, but they are exactly at the time.
Well, of course, <laughs> even scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are exactly perfect. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not humanly possible, but they are as perfectly exact as it is to make them at the time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not perfectly exact. Well, of course, even scientific facts are made at the time, but they are as exact as it well, is humanly possible. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are. Well, of course, even humanly possible scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are at the time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not. Well, scientific facts are not perfect, but they are as exact as possible to make them human. At the time. Well, of course, well, even, even scientific, of course, scientific facts, facts are not humanly exact, possible, but they are, but they are perfectly as exact, as exact and it is to make them at the time. time. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not Well, of course, facts exact, are not even scientific, but they, but they are, are as possibly as perfect as it is to make them at the exact time. time. At the time. Well, well course, even time is not perfectly exact, but, not but <laughs> facts are not, of course, humanly possible. They are perfectly made at the time. At the time. Well, well, scientific course, time is not perfectly possible, facts but facts are exactly exact, human, of course. But they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, well as course, it is possible, perfect humans are in fact are made at the exact time. Well, even scientists are in fact possibly well, not course, human, but they are, of course, not exactly made. Not perfectly exact, but they are as exact well, of course, as even facts are possibly not scientific. At the time. But they are made exact well, by the course, perfect timing. Well, of course, scientific facts are not perfectly exact, but they are as exact as it is humanly possible. Well, of to course, even humanly possible scientific facts are not perfectly well, of course, exact, even but they are at the time. Facts are not perfectly exact, well, as it is possible, perfect humans are in fact made to make them perfectly at the time. time. Well, of course, even uh, well, scientific, well, of facts, course, are not perfectly exact, scientific facts are not but perfect, are as exact as but are as exact as possibly at the time. Science. Well, of well course, if even scientific, scientific facts, facts are perfectly are scientific, exact, then are facts are not as human at the time. To make them at the time. Well, well of course, even scientific facts of course, are not perfectly exact, even scientific facts are not as humanly possible as humanly possible because of the time, at the time it takes for perfection. Well, of course, even scientific facts are not well, perfectly exact, but they are as exact as it is humanly possible to make them at the time. Well, of, well course, of course, even scientific, scientific facts, facts are not exactly are perfect, not perfectly exactly, exactly, but they, but they are, are at the time of making them perfect. Well, well humans are, of course, exact, made possible by scientific facts. As it is humanly thank you, Kevin. Yes, thank you, Kevin, and thank you to the uh, Lighthouse for inviting us here today uh, to give their monthly talk. We are, as has been said, thick here. Um, and today, in this talk, we're going to take a look at, through our short career so far, and um, particularly our biggest work to date, the Ministry of Measurement. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Ministry of, of Measurement. measurement. Would you, Would you like, like to collect, collect some data, data for us? Today we are collecting data about distance. The distance between A, B and C. Take the form away. Bring it back and we'll validate it for you. Thank you for your data. Your data means everything. Please call again.
Okay, so how did we get to that? <laughs> um, we all met on a Sound Art MA course at the London College of Communication in 2011. And although Thick Ear wasn't yet formed at the time, the beginnings um, of what brought us together happened at Currency Programme, um, our midterm show, which we self created as a class. It was an evening event that treated all the works, including sound installation, video work, and performance as part of a single choreographed performance event. The traditional white cube walls of the gallery space are often problematic for sound art um, due to their reflective walls and visual tradition. To counteract this, we decided to split works into those that could form part of louder time program events and those that could run continuously in the background. Visitors could walk around these works as in a normal gallery. Um, then lights were dimmed and they were ushered towards performative events and screenings at specific times. This proved a successful formula and began a deeper group interest in how we could create our work together. When the, we finished the MA, we decided to carry on working together as a sound art collective and Thick Ear was formed. We still argue about who came up with the name, although I know it was me. <laughs> um, so nowadays, we see ourselves as an art collective rather than a sound art collective, or rather than specifically a sound art collective. Um, and how that change has come about, we'll discuss in this, this talk. Uh, yet the name still contains the hints of humour that can be found in our work at times, such as Kevin's introduction. Uh, the first thing we did together as Sick Ear was a group sound arc exhibition called Quite Slight at the Arbeat Gallery at Old Street in London. The space itself was narrow, long, white, and as usual, poor for sound. We'd been to many sound art shows where works drowned each other out, unintentionally creating a single raucous cacophony, the sum being very much worse than the parts. So with Quite Slight, we decided with, uh, to start with this curational issue and work backwards. All the works would deal how they might su successfully cohabit the space first, some even using quietness or subtlety as their starting point. One visitor, Russell Callow, commented on his blog, um, individual works were all interesting and stimulating, but what struck me as most successful was the overall effect of 10 sound pieces in a smallish gallery that did not damage the work of their neighbours. A great example of working for the good of the whole rather than shoehorning in individual works despite their voluntary and frequency demands. And we also carried on in our interest in performance works as a way to get out of the restrictions of the gallery and, and take our art to new audiences. While still conceiving new works individually, we brought these together as evening performance programmes presented at venues such as Troy Gannick in Hoxton, for Music Hack Space, Music Tech Fest at Ravensbourne College, um, and Hack the Barwicken, which we'll talk more about shortly. Um, first, though, Jack's going to give us a closer insight into some of our earlier works. Sure. So, what got. so this is my work, it's called Hush Skylight, so we'll start there. So this is part of Quiet Sight, and I mean, what's significant about this is relatively quiet and quite subtle work. It was definitely about the translation, or included at least, the translation of information from sunlight, which controlled these uh, four light-sensitive circuits. And the four circuits uh, would go faster depending on how much light there is, and there's a quite a kind of straightforward relationship there. Um, but in the context of the exhibition, complicated this by um, make putting a filter in place. So when they were overactive, as it were, too noisy, they actually um, self-silenced themselves. So they went above a, a threshold and then they were silent. So actually for the bulk of the exhibition, it was a silent work. And then in the last hour of the exhibition, <laughs> which, uh, you, well, they, it was, they were active though. I mean, it was, it was always, something was always happening. Um, it, was, it was always happening. I mean, you had to take my word for that, but it was always happening. And then uh, there was, during the last hour of the exhibition, there was this quite performative event. So again, performance is like a constant strand through a lot of our work. So as uh, we reach sunset, and then these uh, kind of circuits emerge, the sounds emerge from below this threshold, you have this performative event in the last hour of the exhibition, because it was, it was February, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was February, so the last hour between five and six was sunset, and you had this event where they emerged out and these kind of very quick popping sounds slowed down as we got to complete night. Um, so again, kind of issue, look at information as well as data there. Mm. 
We can listen to that for a bit, I think. So this is Andrew Davidson's work. Um, and Andrew Davidson's work often uh, features uh, the degradation of data and degradation of media. So he's working both in analog and digital forms and kind of uh, repeating things until they kind of become nothing or a kind of complete mess and just kind of working with the, the kind of the intrinsic integrity of the mediums involved. It's got uh, sound works and video works all working around this theme. And next we've got quite a beautiful, if I can say so for you today, work by Today Ascended, which kind of looks at the sound of the internet and it's in a, kind of like an acoustic ecology study of the sounds of the internet. And actually a lot's spoken about uh, kind of the internet as another world and as another environment. And if there is, this, there is another environment, then the, the, the internet is a very quiet new world, a new environment. And so we've got page after page of websites that contain uh, no sound whatsoever. And then every so often, have we got a slide with one that does contain sound? No. no. Okay, so <laughs> the pages of information where there, aren't, there is sound and where there is like audible content on the website, uh, we, we have these highlighted in bold, isn't it? Yes. yes, brilliant. So again, we're looking at this kind of issue of information and where there is uh, kind of what content is and what values are behind, implied by this content and values. You know, why is the internet such a quiet place? Cool. Okay, so that's the flavour of some of the work we were doing leading up to the Ministry of Measurement at Hack the Barbican Festival at Barbican in London. Um, and just a bit of background information on Hack the Barbican. Um, we found out about Hack the Barbican through our association with Music Hackspace. Uh, today is a member of Music Hackspace, and uh, what's your official title? Event coordinator. Event coordinator at, at Music Hackspace. Um, and um, basically, the Barbican uh, were having refurbishment during August, during the summer last uh, this year. Um, and but they weren't refurbing all the kind of the foyer and public areas of the Barbican, um, and they wanted to keep people coming in, keep a public engagement with the space. So they spoke to um, Charles, um, sorry, what's his surname? <laughs> Charles Armstrong, um, who is the director at the Trampery in London. And they asked him to put on some kind of festival where they could use all of these kind of normally public and non-exhibition spaces within the Barbican to put on an event. And Charles, you know, uh, basically talked to lots of people he knew about what we might do in the space. And for a process of filtration, that came down to Music Hack Space. And, uh, we heard about it. So the chance to present our work within a prestigious Barbican was something too good to miss, obviously. Um, so we immediately got heavily involved with the organisational committee. And in fact, today I ended up project managing the whole event in the end. Um, and we started to think about what we might present. Jack. Cool. Do you mind if that was right? So, I mean, in the early stages of research for Hack the Barbican, uh, we had lots of suggestions of how we could use uh, information which translated the inhabitation of the Barbican and which looked into like creating audible results of this information. And as sound artist and in, an artist interested in digital media and culture, comfortable with applying technology and software, there's this like urge to sol sonify and, and this is kind of like the sound art equivalent of visualization. Um, and it was almost like too expected it's like expectation that we, we would take some information that, re, re, rely, that was resulting, sorry, take some information that was based on people and inhabitation and use that to kind of create some work out of that that would imply something about how inclusive the work was possibly. And so part of a common thread um, in sound and contemporary arts practice to imply like a releasing of control, like you're, you're, you're getting this information and then you're releasing control to it, you know, because we've got... We've got a load of in, we look at a load of data, and w this is led to through this structured process an outcome, and therefore it's part of this thread, which implies that we give releasing control to the system, that there's, and there's an implicit authority in the outputs that come from that because they've come from a place that we say well th this isn't like something I've created or something like that's purely my thought or intention. This is like as a result of this information. So it gives like an authority to the work, which kind of implies. I wasn't in control of that. I didn't kind of intend it to happen. Um, 
but depending on the specific process used and these conversations in the group, um, it seemed to us that any data could be used to create any kind of aesthetic. And the maths involved and the systems were actually like, rather than kind of stripping away conventions and rather than um, kind of releasing control, were actually like a, a, re a kind of more reiteration of conventions and of values. Because if you, once you're putting in those rules into place within your work, actually you're, you're reiterating and you're stating a section of rules. Um, and so rather than releasing control, we argued that sonification, which we feel quite comfortable to talk about quite authoritatively, um, and I could argue, I'd argue hazard visualisation, although we haven't as, as much time spent investigating it, um, are the most controlling systems. They're, they're, because they're systems that are completely reliant upon rules and the creation of rules. And although we're not excluding the potential for sonification or visualization, visualization systems to be part of a dialogue between art, science, and technology, um, to engage these practices uncritically just wasn't in our interest. And like, I think, you know, on a personal level, I think, you're, and I've used, you know, translation of information with my work, and I think you can create some quite interesting theatrical uh, devices, and, but the system that you're creating is definitely an authored kind of gesture. And so this trope, it almost it felt part of like a wider tendency um, with how you were kind of expected to engage between art, science and technology, um, and that it created these like rules and these dividing lines and places for science, and then it, so it said, okay, well this is the science bit, this is your data, and here's, here's the art bit. Here's the, like, the, the picture or the sound at the end of it. And therefore, we've got these defined rules for scientists and artists. And we felt very difficult and very uncomfortable with that because it was also kind of excluding the, the scientists and the technologists from actually that conversation of ideas, which is what we felt that we were there to bring to the conversation. And, and you know, we weren't willing to go along with like an expected uh, sound art response, if you like, to the situation. Um, so as part of the whole process, we, um, we went on a, a radio show called Studio Visit, which is uh, on Resonance FM, which is like an arts radio station, uh, hosted by Morgan Quaintance. And that was like a kind of first like, public iteration of these feelings. Like we kind of released this thought out into the open. And then as a result of that, we kind of felt more confident in them. And I guess a bit like preparing for this talk today and also like presenting the work in the Barbican, these there are these moments where you bring your ideas forward and you share them with the public and it kind of moves everything forward. Um, so we want to create a discourse between art and science, art and science um, that didn't entrench pre-existing practices and didn't include a load of presumptions about how uh, information could be used. So we talked to Ulrich from the Open Data Institute and we didn't ask him to provide us with data or information or uh, like make a database for us. In fact, the database that I made in the end, he was quite, he wasn't that impressed with. <laughs> um, you know, in, in retrospect, I'm not that impressed with it either. But we just sat down and we talked and we had, we had conversations about ideas. And, and I think that is how we're most interesting, how we're most interested in collaborating with art and science. Uh, we are art. So how, we, how is art? We're most interested in collaborating with science or creating that dialogue. Um, and the big conclusion, or not, well, not conclusion, what, where we reached, actually, is that like, sonification, um, it seemed to do within the arts, by kind of assuming an authority and authoritative position, what data does in the real world, and the social and the commercial spheres, which is using numbers to draw seemingly authoritative conclusions, and to give the impression that there, were, there weren't kind of values within those numbers in the first place. And I'd just like to play uh, uh, some, some audio right now. So this is a tone. It's got a specific frequency. And that's controlled by a number. And it's pulsating in and out. And that's the, the rate at which it's pulsating is controlled by, by another tone. In fact, it's a square wave, but I've added one to the square wave, and then I've divided and I've times it by 0.5. The actual maths isn't isn't important, but to create that effect of going in and out, I've put some numbers in myself. And uh, now it's being joined by a whole load of other.
tones doing exactly the same thing. And they're playing sounds for specific periods in time. Um, and I quite like the way it sounds. I mean, I designed this. Like, I like. <laughs> yeah. It's very good. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin thinks it's beautiful. You know, I've and I've sat listening to this for hours and hours while operating the Ministry of Measurement. And as as Kevin and Jeff, and, and today I was hearing it from upstairs when he was managing everything else. So we quite like it, you know. And you know, we walked and every time we walked down to look at our installation, we felt like. You know, this is good, this sounds great. But ultimately, like, what do these sounds mean, yeah? And what are we, what are we tracing with these values, okay? And I think for us, they imply something quite specific and they imply, um, and it's not just kind of like, it's not like an unique kind of sonic quality thing, there's nothing like intrinsic about it. It's a cultural thing and it's in the right, and it's related to that space in the Barbican and the architecture of it. Um, but I think it implies, yeah, operations happening and decisions being made and information being used and applied in some way. So in a way we've created here a sonification of the idea of sonification, the idea of, of information being translated. And what those specific values mean or where they came from in terms of the way that people enter that information. like. I you know, I'm not, I don't mean to be cheating by saying this, like, I don't think it's that relevant, okay? What's relevant is this idea that you're coming along and you're bringing your information and that's being turned into some kind of result. And that in a way that that process is so, like, blunt that it, that it kind of reveals it. You know, it's quite open about that. Okay, so the Ministry of Measurement began to take shape through a variety of influences. A desire to critique sonification, a desire to fit into the concept of Hack the Barbican, i.e. a kind of insertion, an engagement with the space to create something new, and a desire to incorporate the Barbican itself into the work. As sound artists, how might we use the space as part of our work? Could we adapt to the environment as we did with the Quiet Slight exhibition? And the large and complicated interiors of the Barbican have such a strong 60s brutalist aesthetic, how might that be used? So we started exploring the Barbican, thinking maybe how to record it or use it. And thoughts of measuring and mapping led to thoughts of collection of data and data sets. And this line of inquiry inevitably led back to sonification, the subject we were keen to critique. Um, so, but on an early walk around, we noticed the uh, amazing cloakroom space, um, a place of exchange, of transaction. This promoted our first thoughts of a kind of data swap. What if we asked the public to map the Barbican space for us and we gave them something in return using the cloakroom as our workplace? Um, two things were happening here, kind of subliminally really. Um, firstly, we were expanding our palette, moving away from purely sonic concerns. Um, our interests were becoming much wider than sound. Um, and of course, performance had been part of the work in the past, but our medium had always been sound. Here we seem to be developing different interests. Secondly, we were moving away from individual works presented together under the thick ear banner to uh, a single larger and truly collaborative work. Um, we sought to further research, as Jack said, um, by going to see Ulrich Katz and Michael D. Podesta from the um, National Physical Book Laboratory. And, and as Jack said, we kind of, these are more consultations than, than anything else. We'd go and kind of have a chat about kind of cool stuff. And that's really sort of how it turned out. But I mean, Michael was, this is Michael, he was fantastic. He gave us uh, insights into, great insights into scientific language and methods of measurement. Um, I mean, the National Physical Laboratory, for anyone who doesn't know, is the kind of UK centre for measurement. Um, um, and he's highly regarded all around the world. Um, but we, we talked about things like accuracy, how close is a measurement to a true value, and the impossibility of ever knowing a true value. Um, every measurement, in fact, being a kind of attempt at a best guess. Um, and taking more than one measurement by repeating a measurement many times, a mean value can be calculated. Precision, how close are the spread of answers? And reproducibility, the closeness of agreement between measurements of the same thing carried out in different circumstances, i.e. by a different person at a different method at a different time. Um, we also discussed other things like the um, dichotomy paradox, um, if you know it already. Um, if you don't, this paradox um, 
In this paradox, before a man can reach a stationary object, he must reach half the distance of it. Um, before re reaching the last half, he must complete the next quarter of the distance. And reaching the next quarter, he then must, next, he then must cover uh, the next eighth of the distance, and then the next sixteenth, and so on. Um, there are thus an infinite number of steps that must be accomplished before he can reach the object. Uh, and of course, it's impossible to cover an infinite distance, so any object isn't actually impossible to reach. Um, and we talked about the Planck length, which is, uh, you know, uh, in science, theoretically, the shortest measurable length. Um, uh, in fact, it's so many orders of magnitude smaller than any current instrument could possibly measure, there's no way of examining it directly. Um, this consultation um, raised questions of the subjectivity of measurement and the impossibility of the existence of a true value of any particular measurement. Um, and as Jack said, we also went to see Ulrich Katz, um, Head of Stati Statistics at the Open Data Institute. Um, and, you know, amongst many other things, with Ulrich we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of various open data scenarios. You know, the usual things, security, security, privacy and copyright issues versus transparency, problem solving, innovation and freedom of information. Um, and also how data can be used to prove different things by, for instance, extracting the median of a particular data set rather than the mean. So, you know, we were interested in whether data can reveal an inherent truth or is, as often with sonification, does it reveal whatever we would really like it to. Um, Ulrich has since become a kind of chief collaborator in Thick Ear. Um, uh, in much of our work since, and he, he travelled with us to um, Vilnius with us to work on the Ministry of Measurement uh, Data Exchange and contributed to the Data and Ethics Working Group, both of which we'll discuss shortly. Um, and because of our involvement with Ulrich, um, Anna mentioned it earlier, we were lucky enough to gain funding uh, for the Ministry of Measurement through ICT and Art Connect initiative. Um, it's a European in, uh, uh, Commission initiative that supports collaborative works between ICT uh, practitioners, all scientists and arts practitioners um, and the initiative is still running and if anyone here is interested in uh, or wishes to begin such a collaboration they should go on to search ICT and Art Connect and have a look on the website because this funding is still available. Um, so anyway these were just some of the ideas and thinking it came together to form the Ministry of Measurement which finally ran every day for two weeks last August. We used the Barbican cloakroom as a stage to create a giant dystopian data collection centre as both performance and interactive installation. A bureaucratic nightmare nestled deep in the bowels of the Barbican centre. We fed the 11 cloakroom bays, which you can see up there at the back, um, with individual sound and light, acting as, en acting as enormous data banks. The numbered lights flashed on and off in sequence, the sound suggestive of this continuous data transfer as we can hear. Uh, we dressed in uh, Ministry of Measurement uniforms, or MOM as we like to call it, MOM uniforms, assumed roles as operatives and work shifts. Uh, we acted like a real organisation with our own logo and stationery. Within the Barbican architecture and interior design we saw references to dystopian retro uh, sci-fi film and literature and we tried to highlight these and bring them to the fore. But all of these elements of course were just really props a cinematic backdrop to create the right atmosphere for our transactions with the public to take place. We were inviting the public to join our game, uh, a familiar yet exaggerated Kafkaesque situation. As people approached, we asked them to collect data from us within the Barbican. We gave them floor plans and asked them to measure the distance between certain points marked on, on maps. The points were printed as large dots, massive in scale with the rest of the map. There were no corresponding marks on the floor within the Barbican itself. Finding the correct start and finish points was in reality a rough guess for participants. We gave people a choice of which me measurement units they would like to use. Um, should we go back a slide here? So, yeah. Options included strides, body lengths, backward steps, shuffles, hops. Um, when members of the public had an answer, they returned to the counter with their completed data sheets outlining their measurement choices, um, their age and their final measurement. We then entered this into a keypad which resulted in an enormous length of till roll paper um, covered in, encry in encrypted data spewing forth from the printer. At the same time, 
one of the numbered bays would furiously bleep and flash and we would hang up the long data strip in that particular bay. Finally, we would, we would officiate the process with rigorous stamping, crossing and spiking of the data forms and give the person a receipt. The awkward subject, subjectivity of the measurement asked for was in stark relief to the bureaucratic, objective treatment of the answer. Uh, Jack. Brilliant. So, uh, while staffing the Ministry of Measurement, we had lots of like, f comments from the general public, as they've described. And uh, this is my favourite one. One member of the public told me that you could make an amazing artwork with all those pieces of paper. You <laughs> <laughs> really, really, really could, you know. To which I replied, sorry, madam, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> Which I was quite proud of. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So most people enjoyed taking part and submitting their data, with many going to exceptional lengths to show us that they were in on the joke, that they understood that they were taking part knowingly, with a minority uh, becoming quite frustrated by our lack of clarity regarding what their measurements of strides, <laughs> hops, shuffles or body lengths would be used for. People often seem to relish the opportunity to act out one of the daily nuisances of life as if the shared performative gesture could be a process of ex exorcism or catharsis. You know, I, I, do, I fill in this form and it represents all the forms that I have to fill in every single day. And I don't know why filling in an extra form somehow helped with this, but I feel like people did actually get some like, frustration out from doing it. And so while staffing the Ministry of Measurement, uh, during the launch event, we found ourselves in a seemingly like, improbable problem. We had a very large queue of participants, leaving us with too many customers, uh, audience members. We couldn't keep up with the demand to take, take a form away from us, to process the form and put it into the machine. This, this all took a certain amount of time, you know, it took a while, you know. Every <laughs> every single entry. So we had these queues of people to contribute their measurements to the data. And things are starting to sound, feel a lot like a job. I mean, I've had a few, I'd have a few jo dull jobs in my life, and this was feeling like one of the dullest. Um, and Kevin, I think, coined the phrase, it definitely was you actually, um, he said, I'm here to be a data flipper. And we assume that role, you know, this is somebody who, like, who staffs this, Kind of situation who doesn't know what the information's used for. I mean, I think that's like a lot of kind of bureaucratic jobs or kind of roles where we have to fill. Well, this is this is the form you have to fill in. I don't know what it's used for. And this kind of customer service kind of role. It's like maybe I don't know the person who phones you up and asks you, you know, quite nicely for you to sort out things. You get quite upset with them, but and they don't. So MOM in some regards it was a performance of collecting data in addition to being a process of data collection. But ref reflecting on this as a process, we've come to a point where we felt confident placing purely just data collection itself. So um, this is quite, it's quite a theatrical piece, but we came to a point where just the act of collecting data, we felt confident in, in calling that art and placing it within an arts context without reference of, to characters or theatrical devices. And later on, when Jeff will talk about it, when we went to uh, Vilnius and Brussels, we were quite happy to just use the collection of data and the exchange of data as, as, a, as our, and talk about it maybe slightly more openly. Um, and that's just kind of how things have kind of developed in the way we're thinking. And, but one of the things that came out and which, you know, we were quite keen to critique sonification and quite keen to critique the kind of the integrity of data, but the, thing that really came out during the process was this like general concerns which was quite poignant about how some people would feel about their data being handed over and this kind of like pr when you're taking part in this transaction this time and that's something that came out through the praxis which I, is a word that Kevin taught me yesterday but may see the okay cool <laughs> Uh, so we basically we came to a position where it actually became like quite interesting to just explore the aesthetic like principles of of what data collection is, 
and is there like an aesthetic sort of data collection? And uh, a phrase that I've coined elsewhere as well, uh, but I'm just going to quote myself if that's okay. Um, <laughs> Is that, however, at the point that information is turned into data and stored as an archive, a new form of potential energy is created, an energy containing power and risk. As collection, storage, and application of data become increasingly sophisticated and part of a professionalized industry, this potential energy becomes more significant and less understood. And I mean, you know, there's a whole, there are ethical dim dimensions and there's a whole um, situation. Yeah, Honor slightly helps me tweak that, by the way. <laughs> So that full, you know, disclosure there. Uh, like, the, there's this point where, like, you you create this kind of moment of tension, and you've taken this, and we you can talk about purely about ethics and about about culture, but we can also I, I felt there was something quite kind of musical about that actually, and there was this like moment of tension where you've taken this form from somebody, and and we're not sure where it's going to go, and. And, where, and there's like, you know, tension kind of implies some kind of release or at least some kind of like direction or, or travel or energy. And in a sense, we've always left that, left that suspended. Um, it, and, and that's kind of, it, you know, it, it did feel kind of frustrating for some people, I guess, to like kind of not know what was happening to this information. And some people got it and some people didn't. I mean, most people were quite, you know, God, that it was an art event. In fact, I haven't met, wasn't intending to mention it. Well, there was, was a rave there one night, <laughs> and we um, basically, uh, I mean, I don't, off, well, I'm getting, obviously getting older because you had like, like these teenagers and like people in their early 20s coming through like off their faces and getting really, really upset that we didn't know where the cloakroom, that, that there wasn't a cloakroom. <laughs> um, and this was like, you know, almost getting quite aggressive when we were staying in these characters. It's like, well, you know. This, this isn't the cloakroom, this is the Ministry of Measurement. No, it's not, it's the fucking cloakroom. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so we've got to speed up. Sure. So, sorry, let's move on to the next slide quickly. Um, so, but then, so we went to Brussels and like, I think one of the things came out is these concerns, these things were revealing, you know, we kind of were exploring them, not in isolation, but as a group. And we uh, went away to Brussels, and it's quite amazing. Met kind of Josep Perello and a couple and two other artists, Mike and Susanna, working in Amsterdam. And we co-authored this document. And this is an, an exclusively Thicke project. It's part we're part of it, but it was quite. Um, and there you go. There's some writing there. Um, <laughs> I can I can talk about it that way because I helped. I contributed towards it. But it was quite, you know, to co-author this kind of document with, you know, a physicist and statistician kind of really, you know, felt kind of somehow, some way validating the way that we're thinking about things. And I think it was quite significant to kind of create that, kind of realise this wider context of people like sharing the same issues and, and we'd come from it from a certain angle, but we felt like, you know, quite happy to talk about it with others. Okay, so... Um and then finally, as part of the ICT and Art Connection initiative, we were asked to present the Ministry of Measurement at the ICT 2013 conference in Vilnius. Um, clearly, there was no way to accurately reproduce the cinematic experience of Ministry of Measurement at the Barbican um, on a small stand in a conference centre, um, nor did we want to. Uh, the work needed to move on just as our interest in it were developing. The Barbican event had thrown up deeper questions about our daily interactions with systems requiring personal data as a commodity, a commodity given in exchange for supposedly free services. Our natural suspicions about this exchange and the thought processes at the point of exchange have become a new, process, a new focus for us. So for ICT 2013 Vilnius, we created a new version of MOM, the, the MOM Data Exchange. As opposed to the abstract data collected at the Barbican, we asked members of the public to supply us with much more personal information. If they were willing to do so, we gave them a printout of the data provided by one single person at the, from the Barbican in exchange. Cool. So, everybody, we've got some forms for you to fill in. And in return for filling in these forms, we are issuing the first 40 responses. I'm not sure how many of you there are. Probably not quite enough with limited edition data prints. So these are, these are editions, they are unique artworks like everything else. So once I have received my first form, I can issue edition number one. 
and we're going up to edition number 40. I if, think there should, there should be someone on your chairs. Yes, think, you're, you're so really filling it in. Initially there was a survey that was provided for the... It's, um, it's always your house. own, it's always up so, to you how you fill a form in. we might have some more knocking You know, around. I mean, I'm not going to... But they are, you know... If anyone hasn't got... You do one, receive a limited edition shout. piece of data in exchange. There you go, can have the top one. We've got some clipboards as well, if that's useful. Yeah, has everybody got a Has everyone got one? Has everybody got a pen? Has everybody got a pen? Would anyone like a clipboard to lean on? Yeah, Whoops. Down there. Clipboard, anybody? Pen. And there's no hurry, but obviously only the first 40. <laughs> and as soon as you complete yours, put your hand up. Anybody finished? <laughs> Edition number one's always the most valuable. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that got him moving, didn't it? <laughs> right, edition number one. Yeah. If you want to. Okay. Got to give it back to the right person. That's yeah. the key. So this is the gentleman just in front, please. This for the lady on the front. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> He's next. Okay. Do the one at the time. Thank you. Let's make sure we're keeping an yeah. eye on this, Jeff. Yeah, I don't want to mess it up. Two, two it's yours. Two. Yeah, well, well, what, what order? What order? Thank you. Okay. Don't want to order me, mate. I'm, I'm just saying it needs me. to be in a certain order, otherwise it's not the right way. Yeah? Wait, 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 wait. Thank you. We've got to do this quickly. Yeah, yeah. They're fucking loving it, don't they? Everyone there, Phil? It's not going in order. I'm, I'm going to take from Kevin first, and then I'm going to take you, Kevin. No, because these guys have been waiting first. Oh, you you see, no, we can't keep taking from Kevin because they're after the people. You've got to, you've got to take wait, these Wait, wait, okay, wait, wait, wait. Thank you, Paul. When are we going to... Yeah. Do keep back the names? You've got to remember who you got it from. There's no way I'm going to remember. Well, you oh, work it out. Okay, yeah, try and remember. It's yours. Yeah, and that is yours. <laughs> number have you got? We're number eight. You're number one? Eight. Can you remember where, roughly where you got them from? No. Give me about the paper and I'll shout out to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to do that? Shout out to the next. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, 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 cool. So give me back the paper because I have to shout back the name. Okay, I'll give you back the paper. You section. gave me two a minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. See you there, mate. Okay, Jenny, Jenny Lindock. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you back the paper. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Here, here, mate. All right, well, well. all right. In that order. Philippa, yeah. Philippa, yes, it's you. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, well, no, let's, just, let's carry on with this method. All right. Thanks up for all the slacking you did. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Jeff. Kevin. I'm not having it. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. you know it's like. Thank there. you. To be a receipt, be that. Are these all filled up? Yeah. There you go, these. Uh, these yours? These three? No? Okay, who gave me these? Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got the names, but. Uh, okay, George Foss. One. George Foss. I was going to say, you don't look like a comrade, but. Yeah. Well, there's two you go, then. Yeah. You go, George. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Um, Andrew something. <laughs> Anyone called Andrew? Who's done one? I didn't give you that. It doesn't matter. You can still do the name. Ah, Andrew. <laughs> Couldn't see your surname. <laughs> it's all right. No I know problem. that one belongs to you, so just give me the... You don't have to give me the phone. Let's just keep the system now. I'll shut it. No, no, those are fine. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, Lee Ann, anywhere? Take that. <laughs> If you check them, there is because Okay, I think it says Katya. Okay. Yeah. What number is it? There you go, that's yours, thank you. Mm, we don't see many, we shouldn't have done that many. What? It doesn't really matter. I think Jess Freeman or Josh Freeman. <laughs> okay, someone called G. <laughs> someone wrote their name as the letter G. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here you go, Gavin. <laughs> Elliot, where is Elliot? He's there. George Tucker. George. Okay, Shiri is. Where is Shiri? There. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Shiri? Are you sure? Yeah. It's been done, it's been done. It's been done, okay. Mm -hmm. Wait, is that it? Okay, we're done now, I think. Yeah, these are blanks. Can we keep okay, has everyone got one back who filled out a form? Has everyone got one who wants one? This young lady. You are you still waiting for a, for a seat? Okay, do one more. Yeah, shall I just print one off? Yeah, just print one off. Tell her she didn't redo the form, she's been lost there. I'm not trying to get 14 people. Try and get 14 more people. I think, I think that's, that's, that's it. It's done. We're done. No, no, no. These are the, the last ones. There you go. Thank you. That's probably. You didn't want to get one if you filled out a form? Try and get some, yeah, okay. Try and get some more forms. Five. One more who says they filled out a form but they haven't got one. You see, you can't. You can't. Just bang in, mate. You can't. <laughs> I, think, I think they've, they've been done. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Today said so they haven't. Huh? Today said so they One haven't. One more. Have you filled out a no, form? We've given that Definitely. I'm giving it. I've already passed. To just, just, phone, just say, so. just say, just say. Just say. One more. Yeah, give them that because they've done that. You sure? Yeah, because today I messed up. All right. What about these then? Well, I think they've got two. Can we check? <laughs> Everybody okay. got one that's filled in a form. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for taking part. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes. That's it, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it doesn't have a big finish as performances go. It's, you know, it's just, just printing what off you want the material. Oh, it's a Q&A. Yeah, I was going to say, that didn't go with the band, did it? It went really fucking well. What? It went really well. No, I'm joking. I meant the... I'm joking. Of course it went well. Yeah, yeah. There's some more. Shh. To, to some kind of uh, <laughs> scrutiny. Um, but I guess, you know, kind of, uh, maybe before I open it up to the floor, because I feel like there's more qualified people to kind of ask, ask questions, you know, kind of in the audience than there is you know, kind of up here. Um, what, was, what was that about? Like, what, what are you trying to make people feel here um, with this exchange of, you know, kind of value? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's this, um, we're really interested in, in data at the point of exchange, mm -hmm. that the, what you feel when you fill out a form. And, <coughs> you know, some of the questions on there are obviously deliberately slightly confusing or slightly awkward. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of those questions are things that I think we all think about when we fill out forms, like gender, for instance. You know, you often think that's a difficult question to answer. Um, so, I mean, for some people. So, I think, you know, I think that's that's that's. Um, I think it's about just engaging with the process, um, and obviously at that point, that allows a kind of a consideration 
of, of this kind of commodity, data as commodity exchange that's taking place. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, what, so how do you frame something as an artwork? And I think there's this whole history now of like uh, documenting performance practice and having like release, releasing a certain number of editions in associated with that. And that is how you, in performance art, commodify what was previously deemed the uncommodifiable. And so we, we're applying that kind of tradition to these pieces of data that we've uh, appropriated elsewhere. In terms of that, there's, all, there's also the um, tradition of restaging and um, remediating mm. a performed work, making it something else by actually doing the same thing in a different locale or doing the same thing in a different, um, just a different time, obviously. Mm. Um, so in respects of a performative praxis, I mean, that's sort of, um, I meant to say practice then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's, yeah, it's a, docu a form of documentation and as well as performance. And so, I don't know what we're going to do with the other forms either. I mean. Well, presumably you, you, you're applying the strictest, you know, kind of uh, sort of rules and logic of, of, of pri privacy, right? I mean, presumably these forms will be subjected to extremely high levels of, of privacy, or, or are you no, open no, no, to... No, 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 on the train on the way home. Yeah. Right, right so, the, yeah. so the kind of standard UK kind of, you know, sort of no, notion no, of no privacy. data privacy. <laughs> but, can, but can members of the audience do a Freedom of Information Act request to no. receive... I don't know. I mean, like, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I'm sure if you we... scare us enough, we're going to do anything, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we've got um, questions from the floor. Just in the interest of disclosure, we also have another member of the data ethics um, working group here, Elliot, who wrote the terms and conditions which briefly... Stand up, Elliot. Yeah, yeah, stand, stand up, up Elliot. Go on. No, <laughs> no sit down. Um, but this, this line between kind of, uh, you know, sort of parody and seriousness is, is I, I think, kind of highlighted quite mm. nicely with this sort of last, you know, kind of performative action, you know, also with, you know, kind of your introduction, Kevin, and in fact, you know, kind of in the way that um, you wrote the terms and conditions, Elliot. And how, like, do you, are you consciously tried, sort of, if you want, kind of treading this line of kind of satire and parody? Um, and 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 you know, kind of, at what point does the sort of line between, I suppose, kind of fiction and reality, you know, kind of become an important thing to explore? Yeah, I mean, I think one of when we did the very similar performance in, in Vilnius um, with the Ministry of Management Data Exchange there, one of the most worried people um, was a, an artist called Luciana who just met us on the stand. Um, but, you know, it spent a few days with us, but had met us. And she was kind of more worried about it than, than anyone else because she'd kind of spoken to us about what we were doing. And um, it's like, because in reality, we, you know, we, we, we'd spoken to her about, I mean, we haven't got any specific aims to do anything with the data, but we've got any specific aims to not do anything with the data at this point. I mean, it's, it, it's, th there is a line there that we're walking, that we're kind of unsure. And I think it's, it's that, that tension between, yeah, you know, it's quite, it's, there's, there's a humorous side, obviously, there is a kind of humor to what we're doing, but, you know, there, there is an unease, or, you know, there is, should still be an unease about mm -hmm. passing over their data, that data, you know, yep. so. Well, I think, sorry, I, I think we're, as a group, we, we, well, I know I am, we all are interested in um, the aesthetics of failure and, and that sort of, and the comedic as, as, a, as a device. And that's something that if you, if you couple the comedic and failure with something that is so non-comedic as data collation, do you know what I mean? There's that, um, I think there's, there's an idea that using like, originally sonification or visualisation, using that as the start for an artwork is like a generative constraint and it's a way of constraining um, the aesthetics to make work. But I, I, I tend to disagree and think that that, is, it, that constraint doesn't necessarily, necessarily generate um, in, in, a, in a positive way, because quite often using data is the way it's used, as, as both Jack and Jeff said, the way data is used is quite often it's got an aesthetic imposed upon it by the people that are using it, and it's not just used as, as data or as information. Um, so, so, in that respect, I think it's, it's worth uh, parody, parody, I can't say it, 
parodying. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Parodying, yes. The praxis of parodying. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, questions? Gavin? I noticed on the artwork it says that this is now mine. Yes. Mm. Uh, is that full transfer of copyright? Yes. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. So we all know all the data. Just the date on the on just on that your, that piece. Your limited well, edition the print. Ah. So I'm now going to restrict my licensing of that data, so you're not allowed to use it. Why? <laughs> no, I can't. Why? Well, well. So if it's yeah. a full transfer of copyright, I can. I mean, I think yeah. like. Uh, obviously, we're not in complete understanding of what you're saying. <laughs> um, no idea what he's talking about. But that is definitely no, but that is definitely like very important actually. So quite important to be open about that. Well, and it's, a, it's an important distinction on licensing. Yeah, t totally. And, the, and this is the conversation I'm excited to have as a result of giving that over to you. You know, it's like, um, and I think we're not we're not sitting here as like experts yeah. in. In it's data or we're in use. Interested in raising those questions. Yeah. Well, we don't, we don't know what the legal reality of the exchange is. You know, <laughs> we're just interested in raising the question about the legal reality of the exchange. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so that's, but actually, that's an yeah. important point, isn't it? Because that's <laughs> along the lines of the sonification of the sonification. Mm. So, mm. so the you know, kind of not being interested necessarily or not being aware of the legal realities of the exchange, but wanting to raise a question about the legal realities. Yeah. So that kind of mm. that meta level zone of questioning is, a, is a, 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 an actually quite legitimate space to be kind of operating within. Mm. Sorry, you haven't seen no, anything no. all night, please. I, I was just going to say that that's precisely why which is a, a theatrical science fiction uh, format to present these concepts. And well, that, that's pretty much the only answer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's what personally interests me more about um, this project, that it can, it allows us to create an analogy with a fictional um, uh, critical uh, representations of our society mm -hmm. and, and therefore we're kind of safe behind the curtain of the, of the drama so, mm -hmm. and we are allowed to reply mm -hmm. that we have no idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. not lawyers. But yeah. And how many people are aware of the legal reality of the exchange? It's exchanges that we make every day. You know, so. so we've got a couple of hands up. Um, firstly, I saw Julie's hand up. Well, it's just a comment, really, because you can, you can set this up in a performative, fictitious environment and we all understand that exchange. Mm. But what you can't do is, once you've created the data, is say that the data is fictitious. Mm. Because it exists as a scientific well, it exists. Whether it's a scientific fact is. As we because of course science works within paradigms, and yeah. so what's a scientific fact in one uh, one week, one year, one one uh, you know sanctuary is of course uh, totally nonsense. And it's it's a representation of the data that you were willing to give us on this occasion, mm -hmm. having just. Heard well, the no, talks we gave, knowing that we're artists experimenting yeah. in this area. So it's just, it's just a, it, it's one image of your data that you decided to give at that point. There's something of authority there as well, and that's like well, it's implied with it being an edition and being framed as an artwork, mm. and and that's, you know, you've got to take us on our word that this is like real <laughs> information and real data from the Barbican. I mean, like you can trust us, don't worry. But like, um, we're using that you know, the idea of like this is the information and now it's been framed as this other authoritative thing and now it's yours. Well, but I mean, the fact that the, the, the printouts are an addition of whatever number we've, we've chose, mm. again, is something that you, you've just got to take. It's a leap of faith, um, which again is, yeah. is a little bit toying with the idea of the art market exactly. being, being a leap of faith. Mm. I think I saw some other hands. I see some other hands. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Helen. Um, I don't know that I have a, a new question, but I guess I was wondering whether you were, or whether you were surprised before at the extent to which people were willing to um, move from audience to participant to engage in the transaction. Despite, I mean, I know we've, it's been framed as in the frame that's already been described, but I was kind of interested in the, the what felt like a chemical disruption in the affect in the room. Yeah, so things changed. There was definitely stuff going on. 
in the participants, people felt stuff that was different, and they were engaged in almost maybe a pretend competitive, competitive mm -hmm. process, but felt also like, well, mm. maybe, it's actually Jamie, for some of us very real. And I, I wonder, you know, what's your impression of that? that the way in which well, all of a sudden, commerce was involved, wasn't it? There was, there was a certain amount of commerce, whether that's, you know, that's understood traditionally as financial commerce or, or just... As in, I mean, you know, capitalism works very much on, on a win-lose, slum bump Slum bump but That's not what I meant to say. Boom slump is what I meant to say. <laughs> I like, yeah, like slum bump that's 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 I'm going to skip with slum bump yeah. it, it works in a very slum bump sort of um, social-political system. In, in, uh, when we did it in Vilnius, we had, yeah. we had um, far more refusals than we had tonight. You know, yeah. a lot of people said, we're not doing that. And some people said, we'll do it, but can you sign it to say that you won't use our data? <laughs> we're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know. That cultural difference. Yeah. I think we had a couple of other hands up. Can you, t who's still got a question? Elliot? <clears throat> um, I wanted to know, where is the Ministry of uh, Measurement Data? Um, well, the most authoritative source of it is in Well, the most authoritative source of it is in Jeff's house. <laughs> Um, which is like the paper document, and then there's a version on my laptop, which is um, it's actually on Dropbox as well. <laughs> which you can invite you to the party. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which it brings in a whole other <laughs> set of issues. The well, yeah. For instance. Yeah, I I think this is a further. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I think, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering about the gender balance here. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And you were talking about, you know, putting the form about mm. what sex you were, and mm. I, I run an MA course here at Lighthouse, and mm. today we had a presentation of mainly women. I'm mm. just wondering how this kind of works out. I know it's slightly aside from mm. that, but it's just interesting, you know? Well, I think, for me, the reason is a gender bias is because we all met on a sound art MA, and unfortunately, the sound art world is very much about about blokes twiddling knobs. Unfortunately, I mean, I mean, not, but I mean, I mean that's that's the case. Unfortunately, the, the, and, and certainly the sound art and LCC is absolutely amazing course. But it's very, run by two women. It's run by yeah, two women. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, but by unfortunately, artists. most of the most of the intake tends to be men, and I think that's the only reason that we, we're just all men is because we, we came from that. I don't I don't think there's a gender gender bias to to what we're doing at all. Um, in the, in the, I mean, there is in a greater scheme of things, of course, uh, yeah. but, but in, in this group there isn't, if you know what I mean. Oh, but, uh, no? You're not convinced by that? <laughs> you don't look convinced. I'm curious about the gender, gender imbalance in the audience. What seems to be more women than men? Should we collect that data? Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, yeah. We're, we're lucky for that. Oh, and <laughs> Okay, um, so we've probably got time for maybe one or two other short questions. We've got one in the front row, but I, th I have the feeling there was someone in the back row that's had their hand up for ages. Yes? Great. Yep, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when we gave you our data and you promised us some art, what's the value of that art? Have you ever tried to sort of um, measure oh, what it's worth? Well, see, I feel like... Yeah. No, but look, this is there are it's an addition. Layers. It's an addition. There are layers. We'll have to hide it. Sorry? We'll have to hide it. Yeah, I mean, like, it's up to you, really, as the collectors now, to kind of, like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. you know, generate and define its value. Mm. Have you ever tried to, to create that value, like, in the minds of the people that you're trying to make? Well, I tried to quite explicitly. I said, like, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> I said number one's always the most valuable. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I felt like some people were, weren't really believing you know, the value that we could create as a group of artists here today. I mean, but I mean, on another note, like I've seen some pretty, uh, I, can't, I can't say where, actually, but I've seen some pretty, like, quickly knocked up editions recently sold for quite significant of course, yeah. amounts of money. Um, and I think that, you know, relates to people's authority to create that on the art market. Um, we probably have a little bit more authority than some people. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're probably not that, you know. Well, I'm willing to reprint the, the, that edition, actually. I think, you can't do that. No, it's, I feel like as an edition, it's an edition of data. 
and the actual printout, I'm not sure if that's... No, 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 no. Okay. no. no. It sounds like a... Have to have a vote on this. No. Yeah, that sounds like a, <laughs> we're, in, we're in a, a, a sort of inter intergroup debate zone here. Was there one final question? Did you have a question? No? Um, so, well, can we just have a huge yeah. round of applause? Yeah.